Cool. So our next speaker is an engineer, a security researcher. He's a developer of free and open software. And he's not going to talk about any of that today. <laughs> he's talking about something that I've only read about or seen in movies and kind of a far gone era, I thought. He's talking about being a hobo in modern day America. So please welcome John. Hello. Thank you for coming to listen to me make words, and I will try to not fuck it up. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so to start, um, unlike other aspects of like the security or like software industry, um, the community who's doing this like at this time are not doing it for profit, but mostly a lot of people are doing it uh, in order for like survival to get around. Um, America, North America is a very large place. It's not cheap to go from point A to point B there, especially if you don't have a lot of money. So um, in order to protect those folks, I'm gonna keep it pretty high level. There's not gonna be like a lot of really finite details. Um, however, I will give you some resources where if you're interested, I mean, maybe you could look into it further or do this on your own, I guess. Um, so to start also, I have to disclaim that it's like quite dangerous to be running around getting on these like massive pieces of steel with no supervision and like people get hurt every year, die every year. It's also illegal. Um, so part of American culture is ingrained, or rather hobo culture is ingrained and aligned with American culture in a lot of ways due to the Great Depression. Um, and during this time, migrant laborers would travel using freight trains as a means to go and find work. Uh, and this has continued, uh, definitely less prevalent, uh, thanks to you know, the economy turning around in some ways or whatever, but it's still happening. And moving into this, uh, the antithesis, I guess, to hobos would be the rail police. Um, they work as private police forces across the country. Um, employed by the rail companies such as Amtrak or CSX, Union Pacific. And, uh, you know, they've been around for a long time, as freight trains have as well, and they're not really, like, the type of people you want to be talking to if you're going to go out and be doing these things. Um, they drive around in SUVs, they have flashlights, they have guns, and, uh, I mean, they won't shoot you or beat you up if they catch you, but they'll definitely uh, mess your day up. Um, generally, the legal implications of getting caught would be a trespassing charge. Um, however, if you're to be like going into containers or opening things you're not supposed to open, it can get a lot worse, um, legally speaking. Uh, sort of like moving into if you were going to be doing this, uh, the way that a lot of people go about it is by having a basic understanding of uh, the way that a train yard is laid out. Uh, this. Uh, is used in order to sort of guess or infer where something that will take you somewhere will be. Um, so as you can see, there is, I'm not sure if you can read it, but each train yard will have a main line as well as departure yards. Uh, and then there's a space where they build these trains up and generally they'll be classified based on whether or not it is an intermodal or general manifest freight. Uh, these. Uh, distinctions are important because if you're traveling via freight train, you can gauge how quickly something will be getting somewhere, how frequently it will be stopping. So, for example, um, if you are riding, uh, I think it's kind of hard to see, but essentially you have boxcars, grainers, uh, lumber carriers, things like this. These all exist in the land of, inter of general manifest freight and carry uh, large amounts of raw materials, sometimes garbage or whatever, and they have a lot more like places to hide, I guess you could say, and in this case are more useful for riding. So uh, box cars, things like that. The problem with that is that they move quite slowly, um, but the benefit is that since it's low priority freight, um, there's going to be a bit less security. If you get caught on them, like nobody's going to accuse you of trying to steal TVs out of a freight container or anything like that. And uh, 
but then again, you might end it up like you might end up sighted on this like out in the middle of nowhere, waiting for half a day um, in the heat. And so it's like less than ideal. Uh, the other type would be intermodal, uh, which is these uh, containers, which are freight shipping containers. Uh, they're going to have less places to hide. However, the ones that do have places to hide uh, will get you to where you're going much quicker. Um, however, you're going to want to be a lot more careful on them. Uh, for example, there's tagging on the containers and stuff, which is supposed to be tamper, tamper evident notifiers. Uh, messing with things like this and then being caught by the rail police or by the rail police, <laughs> rail police, the regular cops will, uh, yeah, can have a lot worse implications uh, for you as an individual. Um, there's another rideable car, uh, which is the the distributed power units. Uh, they have nice facilities like a bathroom, heat, air conditioning, and AC. However, uh, as with like I've been explaining, the risk is much higher when riding in these cars, uh, especially because all the controls are right there. You have access to the radio. Um, it's not really a place that's recommended to be or be caught in. Uh, yeah. So talking about like the way that people go about these uh, sort of like getting onto these trains or the conditions in which you can actually board something like this. Um, the safest way is probably figuring out where the train is going to stop to switch out the crew. Um, it's most railway or all the rail roads in the U.S. are unionized, and so they have really strict labor laws or labor requirements. So every eight to 16 hours, a train will have to stop and switch out the engineer who's driving it. During this time, they'll do things like inspect brake lines and uh, ensure that you know that all the safety mechanisms are working properly, uh, meaning you have about a 15 or 20 minute window in order to actually board. Um, yeah, uh, this kind of ties back into the layout of a train yard. Generally, if something is just pulling in to swap out uh, the crew, they're not going to be getting off of the main lines. They'll just stop right on the main line and be there for about 15, 20 minutes. You're going to want to like a lot of people like find bushes to hide near these areas um, or what have you. Uh, then also at signaling stations, like trains will wait for clearance, and because of this, uh, you can also get on them, it's a lot less reliable, and sometimes you might end up like waiting around for days uh, for something to show up and stop. Uh, but the benefit there is that you're not gonna be like actually inside the train yard where the poli like police are actively looking for trespassers or, or, or graffiti artists or whatever. Um, as far as getting onto moving trains, like a lot of people imagine when they think of it, like, oh, you have to hop on a moving train. You see it in movies all the time and stuff like that. and. Uh, Super not recommended. It's extremely dangerous. Uh, I know people who, and I myself, have done it successfully in the past. But I also, every single one of my people that I know who are missing limbs or have almost died, it was from hopping onto a moving train. It's extremely dangerous. Uh, a four kilometer long piece of steel does not care about you and it will eat all of your limbs if given the opportunity. Um, these are all just like basic safety precautions or ideas around what it goes into like actually getting on and utilizing this means of transportation. Um, and there's also a lot of resources which can be utilized, which are sort of like open source intelligence, I guess you call it. Uh, uh, Railfan websites tend to have really good data on like what types of trains are showing up at when. Um, there's some like well-known lines that have specific timetables, so you can utilize like forums. Uh, you can talk to people, just act like you're a rail fan and uh, get some really good data on that, uh, as well as there, there are streams of the various like scanner, of the various yard, uh, yard radios and stuff like that, which are actually being streamed. So like, rather than like buying some really like expensive piece of like unique hardware, which if caught, it's like, obviously you're trying to listen to the radio because you have a scanner, you can use your smartphone or even this railroad radio website has a, telephone stream that you can call into the stream and like with like a regular phone. Uh, so it's great uh, if that's what you're into. And in addition to this, there's a lot of like, ev basically every single car has a serial number and is trackable through various means. Um, um, it used to be that this was like completely open. You just dial a 1-800 number and you could track like any car at any time. Uh, you could also like go to the 
railway websites and just like navigate to like through the login page like rather than logging in it used to be that you could just navigate straight to the tracking page and uh, so if you had a smartphone go ahead and like find out like oh this box car is going to be in New Orleans in like a week I don't want to sit on a hot box car going through the desert for a week maybe I'll ride something else or whatever so um, it's actually rather surprising like with the internet and some like googling you can totally just like learn everything that you need to learn about whatever specific ride that you want to take. Uh, additionally, there's like, a there's a, I traveled for a long time with the Railroad Atlas of North America, so you have like actual maps of each major yard, each major line, as well as like, it has like higher resolution maps for smaller uh, lines. And this is really useful because when you're on a massive piece of steel, like a compass isn't going to work very well. It's sort of like hard to tell exactly where you're going all the time. And you can utilize these maps to say like, oh, like, you know, I've been going like what looks like southwest for the last eight hours. What's the only line that goes southwest from the town that I left? Oh, great. So I'll probably, you can like use it to infer your location or where you'll be going, which is quite useful if you don't, you don't have a smartphone or anything like that. Um, yeah, so it's sort of short as far as like actual technical or like in-depth material goes. Uh, this a lot of as as I said before has to do with the fact that I, I try to keep it pretty high level and like um, go over basically like the fundamentals or the idea behind it. However, I'm willing to like take some questions and and talk a bit more about like I don't know anecdotal stories or something like this. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Anyways, thanks. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you know the drill. There are microphones in the center. Well, one microphone. Line up for questions there, please. And maybe I'll start off. Generally, how long would you say you talked about some lines take longer, some lines don't take as long? Yeah. And I was thinking like, OK, a couple of hours. But how long would it? take to cross, I don't know, from uh, New York to San Francisco? Is that even possible? Uh, yeah, it's possible. There's not like a direct route. It would require quite a bit of um, planning or like knowing what you're doing. Uh, but you'd probably have to go from New York to Washington State and then south. Uh, alternatively, you can ride like the midline, which go south uh, first and then like cut through the center part of the country. However, I mean, you're looking at, if you're lucky, seven to 10 days. Some people, it takes a lot longer. Um, trains are rather slow. Like the, very, the fastest you'll be going is maybe, if you're on a high priority freight, like 100 kilometers an hour, like, yeah, uh, 150 kil or no, probably about 100 would be the fastest. So seven, ten days in a hot metal box yeah, yeah. Wa waiting on the side of the tracks, yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, hanging out cool. in a lot of bushes and, uh, yeah. Cool. We have one more question there. Hi. Um, do you uh, generally have a specific destination in mind when you uh, get onto a train? Or? Uh, it sort of depends on the reasoning for where you're going or, like, what you want to do. So if you... It, it just depends. Like, when I was doing it at first, I would just sort of go around aimlessly like just for the sake of hopping trains and then as I got a bit older um, I was like having jobs or trying to work a harvest like you know in the northeast or the midwest so you end up like oh, I need to go to Minnesota to like work this harvest or I'm gonna go pick apples here so a lot of times like you'll have a reason to go somewhere um, although not it's obviously like not required if you're kind of hoboing around like and you have no destination it's not a necessity to, to travel, I guess. <laughs> and, but if you have a destination in mind, is, uh, is it like, uh, do you have a <laughs> high likelihood of success of getting there? Or? Yeah, I mean, it depends on how much research you do and like the type of trains that you're riding. So uh, yeah, if you're just looking to get like from point A to point B, you can use your map, uh, an atlas, or like search online for specific routes, like saying like, oh, freight routes from like this city to this city. Generally, it's going to be major cities which have the, the best routes. And uh, you can use the Railfan websites to like find the name of a weekly or something like this, and then get on that train specifically. So um, yeah. The, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, did you ever get caught by the railway cops? And if so, what happened? Could you tell some anecdotes? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so I was only caught like actually on a train uh, a couple times, and both times I was I was actually just thrown off. Like the guy was like basically, hey, this isn't a passenger train. <laughs> like get out of here or whatever. But I have been. I got a ticket for being on property once in California. So like. You know, they'll run up on you, uh, hop out of the SUV and be like, oh, do the normal cop stuff. And uh, generally it's like, since it's a private rail force, you might get a trespassing ticket, which is actually like a civil fine where like you owe the rail company whatever for the trespassing. And, and a lot of times if you're a repeat offender, you keep showing up in the system, they'll take you to, uh, you know, they'll decide to like make it a criminal, a criminal offense and then like submit it to the government. But in general, it's actually like, Oops, rather low impact, I guess. <laughs> as long as I said, like, as long as you're not opening up containers and like messing with the actual freight, because uh, they carry sensitive materials. So there's like expensive electronics, sometimes like toxic materials, things like this. So you can really like, you're you're d taking really high risk by opening those things, and they can try and charge you with all sorts of fun things like terrorism and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, please. Uh, can you talk about minimizing risk generally and mm -hmm. in whatever category of risk you think is most appropriate? Okay. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, so I would say, like, probably the most important risk for minimization was going to be safety. Like, uh, you don't want to be out there dying on the tracks, like, losing limbs and stuff like this because, one, it sucks for you, and then also... Uh, when that happens, like the police are going to come, the railways become a lot tighter, secu like secure-wise. I mean, there's so many railways, it's almost impo it's completely impossible to secure them totally. But if it's a major railway where there's lots of other riders going, and you go and like lose limbs, then you're going to get in trouble for people. So a lot of times, as I was saying before, you're going to want to avoid like getting on moving trains, or if you're like going through the yard and through the train yard and you're climbing over trains, um, don't be like stepping on couplings or climbing underneath them or anything like that, like you're going to want to use, like pretend you're a rail worker. If you work on the railroads, you're going to use the ladders and the platforms like on the cars that exist there already. And if there's not a ladder or a platform, you should go to a different car because um, these things, they, they can jerk around in the yard a lot or move unexpectedly. Um, and then as far as like once you're actually on the train, because you can be in a hot metal box for a really long time and sometimes getting stuck on the side of the tracks for a long time you're definitely going to want to be prepared with water first aid kits like it's like here it's like drink more water uh wear sunscreen you know things like this bring enough food generally you'll be carrying like at least two days of food in your backpack and then like have extra food to take with you just like really standard stuff like that and then as far as legal risk like being sneaky is the best advice that i can give you i mean don't be seen if possible. Generally, people are like hopping out at night, and then during the daytime, if you're on a train, like don't go like climbing on top of cars and like I don't know, getting drunk and yelling at people on the side of the tracks and stuff like that. Just use common sense, like you know. Can you elaborate a bit on sneakiness in this context? Yeah, for sure. Um, so the idea is like essentially that you're going to want to like minimize your impact at any area that you're in. So you're not going to want to be like going to a train yard, right? And you're like sitting at a bush by the tracks and then, I don't know, digging holes or like doing things to disrupt the area as well as like when you're actually on the train itself, you don't want to be like leaving, like, I don't know, huge tags like sitting in a car and then like drawing on the car or like uh, during the daytime, if you're hiding on a train, you're going to want to stay hidden as much as possible. Basically, like don't move around, don't stick your head out, like just relax, I guess. And um, when entering rail facilities, the best time of day to do that is generally when the sun is down. You're going to want to like be staying on the outskirts. Like a lot of it has to do with like I don't know, just like pretend you're a ninja or something and uh, sneak, be quiet. <laughs> uh, well, if you're you can climb in the units and like there's bathrooms in the nose of the unit for the crews, uh, but you know otherwise just bring a bag, I guess. What was the most dangerous thing uh, that happened to you? Um, nothing specifically to me, because I tend to like be really careful. But 
I've watched people like try to get on trains that are going too fast and like I watched this dude like he threw his dog up into the into a box car and was trying to catch it and he couldn't catch it and then he like was grabbing it he was holding on and his legs went underneath the track uh, the and I was like oh no I'm gonna watch this kid die luckily somehow he didn't and I had to like run down the string and grab his dog out of the because he fell down or whatever so it was like one of those moments where it's like man I almost watched this kid like lose his legs almost watched this dog get stuck on a train about to go to the desert so and it goes back to just like really common sense things like if a train is moving and you really have to get on it like make sure that you can run faster than it first before like throwing all your stuff in it you know like <laughs> or if you're getting on a moving train don't have a huge heavy backpack that you can you know just be very aware of like yourself and your space and uh, that will be the best way um yeah luckily i've never had any like personal like life-threatening moments but i'm like I call it the survival instinct. I'm like, that looks dangerous. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> uh, did you ever catch any graffiti writers when they were at work? Um, yeah, I mean, sometimes, like, you end up in particular yards that are known for artists, like, being there. And, and uh, so, like, you, I never, like, personally ran into any of them, but you'll, like, hear people running around and, like, spraying on cars and stuff, which is... If you're like hiding in a boxcar and you hear someone walking outside the boxcar, it's a bit nerve-wracking. But then to hear a can rattle, is a, you're sort of like, ah, they're being <laughs> illegal too. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Could you perhaps elaborate a bit more on uh, the planning process regarding food, uh, water, other supplies, and also what you do if after two or three days uh, you, you run out of it? It could be that you end up in a place which is, I don't know, 50 miles from a, from a town. You don't want to yeah. walk that. Area. Yeah, for sure. Um, a lot of times, like, with food planning, it's the same as, like, if you're going on a long hike or something like this. Like, you really just want staples that are non-perishable, that aren't going to go bad, like, that are sealed so you're not, like, getting ants all over your stuff. And it really has to go with, like, guessing, like, as I said, you, you know that, like, you could be on a train potentially for seven to ten days. Like, that can be a rather long time, so just plan for that amount of time. And in general, like, as long as you're not riding, like, huge strings of, like, really long strings of empty cars or stuff like this, like, the likelihood of you ending up stranded is, is a lot lower. So the planning of minimizing the risk would be, like, calling in and tracking the, the car that you're considering getting on to find out if it does have a destination, which isn't some like random word that you've never heard of, because that probably means it's gonna like get dropped off at a granary in the middle of nowhere for a week or something. So, and, and I mean, this has happened to me in Utah. I was like dropped at a siding um, and you end up like walking a couple miles and, and then hitchhiking or whatever uh, to like get back into town. But yeah, a lot of it is like always have more water than you think you need, always have more food than you think you need, and uh, be prepared to like have to walk a long ways. And what do you do during the traveling? Are, are you reading stuff? Or are you yeah. singing? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it depends. Like uh, some people are like traveling with instruments. I usually had a book. Yeah, I just like be reading different books and stuff or like figuring out where I'm going next. So. You have a railroad atlas, like there's so many lines and like so much space to cover that a lot of times like if you're on a train, you're just researching like where the train might be going, like where you want to go next. And it's sort of like, uh... and then also the scenery, like you see amazing things that roads don't go to. So there's like really beautiful scenery that you can just kind of sit around, get drunk. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, um, please can we stick to one question now and then just circle around oh, yeah, when, if you have two questions to ask because we're getting a line there. So, uh, is it very common to run into other people doing the same thing? Like, do you jump on a carriage and be like, oh, hey, cool, nice to meet you? <laughs> uh, generally, you're not going to like get on the same car as somebody by chance because like any any train is going to have like a long a large amount of. Uh, but yeah, in the train yard and stuff, you'll see people like sitting at the, near the tracks drinking or like doing whatever, but depends on if you want to go talk to them or not, that's up to you. <laughs> what sort of people do you meet doing this? I mean, like who, who does this these days? What's, what's yeah. your sort of sense of, of, of who's, who's doing it? I'd say a range is pretty like, it's a large range of people. Like sometimes you just see like, there's like young people who like learned about it through like whatever culture like one time I met this old dude who's he was like a really normal guy and he didn't have a backpack and he had a bible he told me he was like hopping trains for Jesus and stuff so like yeah. 
a lot of crazy people, a lot of like normal people too. It's, it's like anywhere, like it just happens to be that they also are into trains, I guess. Did you ever meet normal people working there and how was it like? How did they react? Did they look aside just pretending you don't see you or did they talk to you? Uh, that also varies. Like, I think there's a level of understanding in the rail industry where like people see hobos and stuff and sort of like some people appreciate them and like understand that like the cultures go hand in hand and then others don't. So like I've had rail workers give me boots or like throw water at me and stuff and like help me out or then you have rail workers that just call the rail police on you. So um, uh, generally though, like if you're mostly hidden and you're not like being a dick and like just like making a mess and stuff, they'll usually kind of turn a blind eye. Uh, that being said, like it's hard to know if they're turning a blind eye because you don't know if they see you unless they come up to you or the cops show up, so. Hey, um, is there a culture of helping each other? You told about grabbing the other guy's dog off the train. So do you leave signs for each other or oh, yeah, if yeah. you have spare food, leave it somewhere where people can find it? Word. Yeah, I actually meant to talk on that. But um, so, yeah, there's like this like mythology of like hobo signs and stuff like that. Uh, and it's kind of like, I don't know if it ever happened, but nowadays it's not as common because you sort of like have a way of like, you'll see people and they'll tell you tips or like tell you about what's going on. Um, and generally like, you're not gonna wanna like leave really. I mean, if you have a signage, right, which is well documented and then you're leaving these signs everywhere, it sort of exposes people who also may wanna like take advantage of like other, of hobos or like the police or whatever. So it's like a bit, it's like poor OPSEC, I guess you'd say. And, and so generally like people aren't doing this these days. Cool. If there are no more questions, we are great on time. Oh, one more question. Maybe one more question. Have you ever heard of uh, uh, hoboing in other continents? Uh, no, I heard some folks saying that you could track all the trains in Australia, but I'm not sure like why. I mean, I wouldn't really want to hop trains in Australia because that's a really like scary, hot place. And I don't like, I like mountains and snow and stuff. So. <laughs> But yeah, I haven't heard that much about, oh, actually, I mean, of course, like, it's central to North America. So, like, Central America, Mexico, South America, stuff like that. I'm sorry, I completely, like, didn't mention that. Um, it's still super prevalent down there. I mean, this is how people get around. Um, a lot of, like, exploited peoples are, like, using the rail system in order to travel to, like, find work or, like, get to better situations. So, yeah, it's very prevalent. Um, are sheriffs afraid that you are a Rambo? <laughs> I've never been accused of being Rambo, but I had, generally when they run your name, that's like the first thing. They're like, we just want to make sure you're not a murderer, so give me your name, yeah. <laughs> cool. Then thank you very much again. It was a very interesting topic.